This is Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. I'll talk at all crime. The pharmaceutical Enron, two of the nation's top financial investigative journalists, including one who exposed Enron, one who went inside the collapse of AIG, take on the valiant drug pricing scandal tonight on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Bethany McLean has been on the show to discuss her excellent book of the financial crash, which was All the Devils Are Here, The Hidden History of the Financial Crisis. He's also the co-author of one of the best business books ever on Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. More recently, she wrote Shaky Ground, The Strange Saga of the U.S. Mortgage Giants. That was about Fannie and Freddie, and we interviewed her about that. Roddy Boyd is the founder of the Southern Investigative Reporting Foundation, formed in 2012 as a nonprofit with the goal of providing in-depth financial investigative reporting for the common good. He's the author of Fatal Risk, a cautionary tale of AIG's corporate suicide. He was a guest on the show for that. It was the 2011 Financial Times Goldman Sachs long-listed book of the year for business. Welcome back, Roddy. And Roddy, originally from Greenwich, I could Koskov in particular, and Bethany from my original hometown in Chicago. How are you guys? We're doing great. This is coming from the Netflix Dirty Money series on Valiant Price Gouging, so for folks can go out and take a look at that. It's really excellent. Bethany, just to start off, um, in the big picture sense, is there this big dark side of big pharma, or were just these just bad guys? I think there is a big dark side of big pharma, and these are, in a way, the epitome of it. But what to me is interesting is the name most people in the country know is Martin Shkreli, right? Yeah. He's the guy who infamously jacked up the drug, of, the price of this life-saving drug, and you know, he went to pr- prison on un- unrelated actions, and he, you know, was sort of smirking, and he was called in front of Congress. And I remember sitting with an investor, a big Wall Street guy, who was telling me how horrible Martin Shkreli was, and I looked at him and said, "Well, why is what Valiant's doing any any different?" And he looked back at me and he said, well, well, that's a good question, because they were doing exactly the same thing, that is, jacking up the price of life-saving drugs. Uh, but for some reason, Wall Street loved them because they were making money for people on Wall Street. And to a lesser degree, this is what all of the pharmaceutical industry has been doing for years. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the backstory of this and Michael Pearson in particular, the CEO, and what they built. So Michael Pearson was an ex-McKinsey guy, oddly enough, just like Jeff Skilling of Enron, an ex-McKinsey guy, who came to take over this really struggling, um, failing, small-time Canadian drug maker. And Pearson turned it into an acquisition machine, um, and he sold the story to Wall Street as this ability to not only buy other companies, but also to do things with, without R&D. So if you strip the cost of research and development out of the drug business, the cost of actually developing new drugs that might save people's lives, his argument was you can have a much more profitable business and we'll just buy drugs instead of spending the money on, on, on R&D. And that was just one example of ways he came up with basically to kind of game, game the system. He also did a thing known as a reverse merger with another company that enabled him to have the, low, the lowest tax rate, I think, in corporate America. It was around 4 or 5%. Um, incredib- incredibly low. And he built this this machine um, that Wall Street loved. They thought he was a demigod, and he had some of the most famous investors um, and supposedly the smart money in, in, invested with him. Um, but one of the things he did that skeptics pointed out was actually just acquire drugs and then boost the price on them so he could strip more profits out of them. Before we go a little bit deeper in that business model, tell folks an example that hits home that, you know, actually folks who needed drugs to survive like cyprine, what he did to the pricing there. Yeah, so there's a very rare disease called Wilson's disease um, where your body can't metabolize copper, so it stores in your liver and you die. Um, and there have long been, since the 1950s, a couple of drugs that will treat this, known as cuprimine and cyprine. And cyprine is kind of the gold standard of, of the two drugs. And they were um, owned by Merck for a while. They were very, very cheap, maybe a dollar a day. Um, they'd been developed basically in a basement by a British pharmaceutical guy in the 1950s. There wasn't some big, complicated, multi billion dollar investment required to, to, to develop these drugs. And Valiant ended up buying them and boosted the price of Cyprene to over $300,000 a year. Um, and the argument, his argument was always that, well, the insurance will pay for it, right? So, so, so this, is, this is the insurance system. But of course, that's a false argument because, A, we're all the insurance system. So if the insurers are paying for it, we're paying for it. And B, there are people who can't get insurance, who therefore couldn't get their, their, their life-saving drug. And then C, there are people who do have insurance, but because of this situation with the drug, are absolutely live in panic of losing their jobs or um, having their retiree plan change their insurance program because 
even if they've done well in life and have good savings, if you have to pay out of pocket over three hundred thousand dollars a year for the drug you need to save your life, you're you're you're, you're done. You're wiped out. Going back to the business model, Roddy, I want to ask. Um, when I first heard that, it sounded brilliant. You know, you strip out all the R and D costs, you raise the prices. It's an automatic, um, automatic home run. But you think about it, it means that you have to keep bringing in more and more companies because as you take out the pipeline and you suck up the short-term profits, you got to go find something else. And that's a Ponzi scheme, isn't it? Eventually, they would have had to own every pharmaceutical in the, in the world. Well, yeah. I mean, they're, and credit where it's due, I guess, they they were getting there. <laughs> they, uh, I think, uh, from 2009 through uh, the end of, of uh, 2014, I think they purchased 109 or 110 pharmaceutical companies. And, I mean, that's it's just a boggling, uh, mind-boggling amount. And, and when you actually think of running an enterprise trying to consolidate 110 separate, uh, uh, you know, payrolls and, and you know, uh, uh, benefit systems and human resources, I mean, you really have a, a sort of a colossus that's, that's out of control. I mean, they, 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 they'd grown so fast, uh, uh, you know, they weren't even paying bills in certain places. I mean, it was, uh, it was truly out of control. Does it seem like, uh, uh, like Tyco and all? Cause I remember interviewing Kozlowski, and they want, these guys wanted to be top five in 2016. Was, 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 it, was it another Tyco? Certainly that business model, I mean, they were very proud. I mean, in, in the Netflix series, uh, there, there's great footage of, of uh, Mike Pearson saying, you know, we're in the market where we're looking to acquire, uh, you know, where we're back in business. I mean, he was not shy about saying that, you know, to your point, he wanted to be top five across a series of categories and uh, was very uh, driven by, by acquisition. And, and, you know, to that end, I mean, you're absolutely right. It was a logical impossibility. Eventually, they would have purchased everything that, you know, held itself out to be a pharmaceutical company. Which leads me to ask, uh, why wasn't, wouldn't that be obvious to Wall Street? I mean, these guys were the darlings. The stock price went up to 260 bucks, worth $90 billion. It didn't, it, it didn't it seem um, an asset stripping or whatever you want to call it, financial play? Was it, shouldn't it have been more obvious, put it that way? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and to some people, it certainly was. Uh, you know, as, as Bethany and I wrote, you know, it, it, in you know, different publications, I mean, it very – very demonstrably was uh, a, a business model that had uh, massive flaws, but the stock the stock price kept on going up because they kept on you know reporting larger revenue. Uh, uh, they had the, all these uh, customer what they call bespoke metrics, these non uh, traditional accounting measures that they kept on hitting because they kept on purchasing you know more and more companies, uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a very circular series of arguments that, that you know, we'll, we'll keep on growing, and, and, you know, as long as growth is there, Wall Street analysts uh, could be uh, uh, readily persuaded. More and more to the point, they, they provided large amount of fees to Wall Street's uh, yeah. investment banks uh, for, for mergers and acquisitions and, and then, you know, uh, uh, arranging bank lines and, and so forth. I was going to say that it, it also, when, when I wrote about the company, I struggled with this very question. Why, given the obvious flaws in the business model, people who were big believers in this company were, were the supposed smart money. It was a well-known value investment firm called Sequoia. It was Bill Ackman's Pershing Square, and Bill Ackman at the time was regarded as one of the best hedge fund managers out there. It was all of these companies known as, all these hedge funds known as Tiger Cubs because they're offshoots of um, the famed Julian Robertson's Tiger Investment Tiger management. And so these were the supposed smart money that were the big owners of these stock, uh, the stock, and they were the people who would normally have been skeptical. And what I finally decided was that it was in many ways a cult of personality. And the cults of personality are the most dangerous stories on, on, on the street. And it was a cult of personality around Mike Pearson. These, these people just believed in this guy. They thought he could make them money. They saw in his 
and he was he was a guy who was rough around the edges, but they saw in that sort of the signs of somebody who was a truth teller, and they liked the way he 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 had figured out how to game the system, and they thought I think that he would game the system to their advantage, but it was really it was a cult of personality in a way that. I don't know that you can ever fully understand cults of personality. Well, that's exactly where I was heading. Let me ask you this before we go deeper on the investor side. Is, is this guy Pearson? Um, uh, Charlie Munger referred to what they were doing as deeply immoral. But, of course, Wall Street's not really known for focusing on morality one way or the other. It's more amoral. Is, is Pearson himself, was he kind of a bad guy? Or, or was he just doing what you know what what a guy should be doing, which is to profit maximize and get the share price moving? Well, it's it's an interesting question. He was a very complicated guy. His personal life was 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 extremely complex. Uh, interesting relationships and uh, um, and a, and a few and a, and, and, a, and a drinking problem that had resulted in a few DWIs. So he was he was a complicated guy, which doesn't make him necessarily a bad guy. Um, mm-hmm. But there's but there's always been an implicit sort of trade off in business that you yes you try to maximize profits but but you don't you don't do certain things and what Mike Pearson did was blow all that up so there was almost an unwritten law in the pharmaceutical industry you put some money into R and D and in exchange for the massive profits you make you try to do something good for the world you try to invent drugs <laughs> that will save people's lives right and and it was it was just sort of this unwritten trade off and Pearson just blew all that up he was like well I don't need to do that why why do I why do I need to do this? Why don't I just do the profit maximizing part? So I don't know if I would, if that's necessarily, and he had, I don't know if that's necessarily bad. He took advantage of every single loophole there was to make money without the the concurrent sense of responsibility that 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 we need to have a functioning business system. And I've often thought about that after after the fact is that there there is, there are these unwritten laws of morality of giving back of some sense of responsibility to something other than the bottom line or the system really doesn't work because Pearson to me is emblematic of what happens if your only focus is delivering profit to your to your shareholders and you'll do it by any means necessary. But Roddy no, he, may have he, a different he, take. Roddy, do you? Yeah, I mean I I would I would simply reiterate what Bethany said and add that I see him as amoral. I mean, I didn't really, yeah. not only was he, he was very proud uh, in, in my conversations with his Confederates and even family members of his ability to master loopholes. And, and that was, as, as, as Bethany noted, you know, a, a tremendous selling point to, to institutional investors and, and to even, uh, uh, you know, rival uh, CEOs. And, and he also... Uh, I, I think he very clearly, uh, and, and probably explore this later, I, I think he very much wanted to go to the line of, of what was allowable and other things like, you know, accounting and disclosure. And I'm sure we'll explore those later. But, I mean, he was, he was yeah, I, I just see him as an amoral character. Um, they show it. They mentioned it in the Netflix uh, Dirty Money thing that he and, and uh, Bethany mentions. He sort of disappears uh, when things start getting bad, and some people think it uh, might be because of the drinking problem or he had pneumonia. Do you know what, what was going on there? Was that planned, or was it just as it appeared to be he was sick and had to go to the hospital? I, I think he legitimately was, was ill. He had a, a, a fairly rare strain of viral pneumonia. Uh, in some sense, brought on by, you know, Bethany did know he has a, a fairly astounding drinking problem, and and for multiple years, uh, and and had let his health lapse, uh, which which would be immediately obvious to any viewer of the series, and he he had collapsed uh, over over Christmas. Uh, uh, of 2015, and was taken to a to a hospital uh, in New Jersey. So I mean, I, I the health scare was was quite real. Okay, and of course, it highlights that the board must have not been on top of it um, because it wasn't really reported uh, as it should have been. Certainly, the drinking problem, I guess, didn't seem to be handled. Um, the the, the uh, 
on the Netflix thing, it's a great thing of Bill Ackman and Charlie Rose when Bill is in the height of his, and he's this smug guy, he's, you know, sort of modestly saying, well, I, we do get some of these right occasionally. And since then, it's been pretty downhill for um, Bill. It, it, was this, he called it a failure of due diligence testifying in, in front of Congress. Is this a failure related back to his arrogance again, to be blunt? Well, I mean, I, 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 it's not for me to judge whether he's arrogant or not. It certainly was an all-time historical epic failure of due diligence on on multiple fronts i mean bill ackman is, is a profoundly intelligent man and, and and prided himself uh at his as pershing square fund of you know sparing very little in in the uh in in research but I, it seems to me that like a computer problem uh he he started with a premise and simply sought to con- confirm his premise, which was that Valiant was a tremendously rapidly growing enterprise and would continue to do so. Uh, he was very attracted by Mike Pearson's uh, appalling compensation scheme, which was he didn't receive his salary and would only get compensated if uh, uh, in, in shares and, and in and stock options. And I, I it's. Again, I, it's, hindsight is, is a very uh, a clear thing to look through, but, I mean, he, he simply did not step back and ask himself uh, some, some very basic questions. All right, uh, Bethany, yeah, go ahead, Bethany. I was going to say, Jim, the way I, I think about it is I, I, I'll disagree a tiny bit with Roddy on this. I don't think it was so much a failure of due diligence because the information was right there. There were no shortage of skeptics. Of them even gave um, even even they shared their analysis with with people who were believers in the stock. What it was was a failure to look at things through the right prism. Reason people were completely just just believers in this cult of personality around Mike Pearson, such that they could look at the information that they were seeing about the price gouging, about the accounting irregularities, about Pearson's odd behavior, and they just didn't put it together. But it's not that they didn't have the information and they didn't, they didn't see it. They just couldn't process it in a way that made them say, I better get out of this company. I better stay away from this. And it seems so, as Roddy said, it seems so odd in retrospect that anybody would, would make that mistake. But I think these stories are often not so much failure failures to see something as they are failures to put together what the thing that's right in front of you actually means. So, Bethany, as we finish up this segment, does that mean that there were some shorts um, that, that, were, that came up against that, and they're always controversial? Some people help, feel they help bring down Lehman Brothers and things like that. Did they play a healthy role here? Well, I'm a, I think short sellers oh, almost always play a healthy role, and even it, it, in the sense that they're the people who are incentivized to figure out what's going wrong in the market, what's fraudulent, what doesn't make sense, and the shorts indisputably played a huge role um, in Valiant. It was starting back um, a couple years before the company's companies collapse when a prominent guy named Jim Chanos, who was the first guy to, to sound yeah. the alarm on Enron, actually said publicly um, that he was skeptical of, 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 of Valiant. And a guy named John Hempton, who's an Australian hedge fund manager who's got quite a following, started posting on his blog public information, publicly dissecting Valiant's financials and saying why 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 the, why the business model um, um, didn't 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 make sense. So the the, in, the information was 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 out there. It was just that people who are believers in this company refused to acknowledge it. All right, and as we end this segment, August 5th, 2015, Valiant's stock price reaches $262.52, up from almost nothing. The CEO, Michael Person himself, is worth $2.5 billion. It's a house of cards. That's what we're going to find out next.
and we're back. We, our guests, Bethany McLean and Roddy Boyd, both renowned financial investigative journalists. And when we last left before the break, we were looking at value at its peak $90 billion value. We're going to see this disappear almost overnight. But, Roddy, this was a house of cards. You became the detective that really broke this on Philidor. Take us through the story. As you noted, uh, in, in the summer of 2015, uh Valiant Pharmaceutical International was perhaps America's highest flying company, uh, was worth $90 billion, was uh, its stock chart looked sort of like a, uh, you know, like you were charting a moonshot, it was sort of a straight up and uh, and made a lot of people a lot of money. In this, about that time, I, I had been following uh, the company, uh, as, as, as Bethany and I noted, it had been a something of a controversial uh, uh, moonshot because it did have a, a chorus out there of naysayers, these uh, short sellers and skeptics, and, and there was they were quite vocal in their disagreement with the business model of the company, saying that there were any number of, of uh, what they argued were fatal flaws. I, you know, I'm an investigative reporter. My job isn't necessarily to sit there and be a referee. Uh, so what I did is, is uh, I did my own work. I sat down and decided to try and understand the company. I, my sense after having done this for a lot of years was that there was a story there, but I simply didn't want to parrot one side or another's uh, version of, of the facts. So I, I started digging into the company, and I soon found out that the, the framework, the outline of the short argument, uh, the short seller uh, brief, as it were, was that it was, you know, this was a, a roll-up, a company that was simply vacuuming up dozens of other companies and wasn't able to grow organically. But in and of itself, of course, that's not a crime. It, it, I think it's a flawed business model. But one kind of sleepless night in the, in the late summer, I had come across on a message board called CafePharma.com was sort of a, an industry site for pharmaceutical representatives to go and drop the dime, as it were, on, you know, this company's sales aren't really all that or this company's doing really good business because we've got a hot new drug and you know, it, it's sort of like a like a fan site for pharmaceutical representatives. And in scrolling through the Valiant page of Cafe Pharma, I came across a couple of Valiant salespeople just asking one another a question in the open, saying, "You know, what's Philidor? What is what is what is this company?" And I was like, "What is Philidor? I, I make no sense." <laughs> And one guy said, uh, one guy posted, basically, it's this kind of workaround to keep the prices high. And I was like, wow, you know, that's really interesting. So I managed to reach out and have a conversation with one of these posters. And we went back and forth. Uh, the guy didn't want to go on the record or anything, but he said, you know, he had asked the question of his boss you know, what is Philidor? And his boss pulled him aside as if he had, you know, tried to spill the uh, the keys to the kingdom, as, as it were. And then he said, you know, whatever you do, you know, don't be asking that question in public. Philidor's the secret sauce to this company. It's how we keep our prices up. The insurance companies will kill us if they ever find out. You know, the orders are from on high. Don't be discussing Philidor. Just do what you're told, and everything's going to work out just fine. Well, you know, that struck this guy as really weird, and he eventually wound up leaving the company in, in, in short order. For an investigative reporter like myself and, and, and for Bethany, that is the absolute dog whistle for drop everything and start investigating Philidor. Because if, you know, when, when somebody's like, look, you know, what we're doing is illegal, let's not discuss it. That is something, as an investigative reporter, I want to know everything about. I want to be in the middle of it. And so I, like a reporter, just dropped everything I was doing. I was investigating a couple of other companies in parallel to my Valiant work, and I, I dropped the, that stuff. I don't even remember what they were now. 
I began throwing myself into, you know, what is Philidor? How is it so important to Valiant that fairly high compensated salespeople are afraid of asking uh, or discussing this with their bosses? And I hit the Internet. I began making phone calls, dozens and dozens. And then a few dozen on top of that, you know, what is Philidor? What is this company you can't ask about? And as it turned out, it was a pretty large secret right out in the open. What it was was a uh, drug distribution. I mean, in, if you were to see it the way Valiant wanted you to see it, it was simply a drug fulfillment or distribution center where you would call in, and, and if you didn't have government insurance, in other words, if you were privately insured with you know, Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield or Travelers or any other health care plan, you could get your Valiant branded pharmaceuticals, specifically your dermatology products like Retin-A or Jubilia for foot fungus or any of a, any you know of a number of other insurance. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Valiant products. You could get those at a. Uh, you'd get them you know next day a three month supply for low or no copay, and they'd build the insurance company. And if you're a certain kind of uh, consumer, usually older or, or very busy, that's a great deal. You get your two or three months dropped right on your doorstep by FedEx by 10 a.m. and you blow or no copay, you know, sign me up. And it made sense. What people weren't seeing was that there was behind the scenes a very extensive multi-state effort to uh, rig prices artificially high. What Philidor was doing behind the scenes was, uh, to varying degrees, highly illegal. They had sought to register as a pharmacy in a, a number of different states to get around longstanding American rules about uh, shipping drugs across state lines. Uh, granted, these are not uh, narcotics. These are, you know, these are topical skin type treatments and they would try and register these pharmacies and it was all very benign names like West Pharmacy or uh, RNO Pharmacy, nothing that would, you know, had any connection to Valiant. And they would use the, what they call the NPI, the National, uh, uh, you know, it was a, it's the sort of the tracking number for pharmacies uh, allowing them to ship uh, across drugs across state lines, uh, and and that's how you would account for them at various insurance companies. They would be able to, you know, in in return for a low copay, they would bill the uh, insurance companies these outrageous sums. I mean, Retin A, for example, was a drug that had been developed in the early 1980s to treat acne, and had gone through uh, uh, some controversies regarding, you know its effect on women and possible birth defects, and was selling for $15, $20 a tube uh, until Valiant bought it and, and began, like Bethany said, you know, jacking the prices up 30 40 50% a quarter to the point where it was, it was selling for $900,000, $1,100 a tube for effectively zit cream. And they would work out and nego- they would negotiate with uh, insurance companies and get, you know, they would list the price at a thousand dollars and take in eight hundred dollars a tube, you know, something that cost them, I don't know, eighty cents a dollar a tube to make and ship. And so uh, you could see right away that, that if you thought about it, Valid- uh, uh, Philidor was Valiant's economic engine. It was the thing keeping a heavily debt laden. Uh, company afloat, and then they were keeping it the ownership of Phil, Philidor concealed, right? Is that basically what was going on? Yeah, uh, they had they had kept it well concealed. Uh, it had been set up uh, by uh, a guy, a, a pair of brothers, Andy uh, Davenport and his brother, uh, and and they were uh, based outside of Philadelphia, 
and it had been set up in conjunction with a Valiant executive named Gary Tanner uh, working in the background, and they did not, you know, given that it was the quote-unquote secret sauce, they did not want Wall Street or anybody to know about this, most, of, most especially the insurance companies. So they had used a very complex series of shell companies and mm-hmm. paper constructions to, to hide the ownership. And so how is, it, how is it, Roddy, that the insurance companies would agree? How did they get the insurance companies to pay these outrageous prices? You know, that's a great question. Uh, and some of that is still emerging today. Uh, what they would do is they would eventually negotiate with the insurance companies and say, well, look, we're selling Retin-A or Jubilee or some other non-complex, non-narcotic type treatment, you know, for $1,000 a treatment. We can eventually sell it to you for $600, you know, at a 40% discount. And insurance companies basically thought that that was a good deal. They decided to be very passive uh, and and didn't really ask a lot of questions. Uh, and so they they tolerated it. I mean, it's it's part of the broader, uh, you know, part of the broader problem in our healthcare system where you can yeah. go to a company and say, oh, look at a 30% discount I'm giving you to list price. Aren't I a swell fellow? And, you know, the reality is is sharply uh, to the contrary. And, and, in fact, it was really sleazy because if they rebuffed it, they just shifted the uh, pharmacy name or one of these other shells and, and resubmitted it. Tell us how they ended up um, setting a trap on their self, right, by sending this invoice to R&O, one of these, you know, sort of shell companies. It was remarkable. I, I had found a lawsuit in uh, Los Angeles uh, Superior Court where – R&O Pharmacy, a small compounding pharmacy, in other words, a, a, a business that, that shipped uh, custom or handmade versions of, of certain drugs. Uh, you know, certain people need certain drugs and certain strengths. And so you would go to a, a compounding pharmacy, pay a little more, um, usually in cash and trying to recoup the costs uh, with your insurance company uh, privately. And, and Valiant had set about buying this compounding pharmacy and had actually just about finished closing the deal uh, when they began shipping huge amounts of their drugs through uh, R&O's uh, NPI uh, number. It's custom, you know, national pharmacy uh, descriptor. And, and the guy who ran R&O, the R in R&O, a guy named Russell Leitz, one day got a PDF from the California Board of Pharmacy saying, you know, here's your monthly shipment of drugs. You know, you have to sign off on it as per your uh, pharmaceutical license. And he looked at it and, you know, he usually did a, maybe a dozen, two dozen shipments a month. And he turned around and saw, you know, many thousands of drug shipments using his his billing number and you know as he describes it had a heart attack and was like what the hell is going on you know i didn't i didn't ship anything like this you know name of god what what's happening i i think the language was a little more colorful but you, you take my uh you take my point and he refused to sign off on it you know russell reitz is a Old time by the books guy t- takes his job as a pharmacist very seriously and is very proud of it and said I I'm not, I know I've signed you know I, I I've agreed to sell this to Valiant but I'm not signing off on it and he makes a phone call to the company that he sold his pharmacy to a company called Ipsolani that was based further up the coast in in, uh, in another California town. And the guy who answers the phone answers it, you know, hello, Philidor. And he says, you know, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I must have the wrong number. And the guy says, oh, hey, Russell, what's up? How are you? You know, and, and he said, oh, it, it turned out it was the guy he had negotiated with to, to sell R&O. And he said, hey, look, you know, I've, I'm in the middle of something. This 
transaction is going to get delayed. Uh, there's been a mistake with the California Board of Pharmacy. We have thousands of drugs that are said to have been shipped from us. Uh, you know, R and O here in, in a small little strip mall in Los Angeles. You know, it's I'm working this out. It's going to be delayed a week. The guy said, "Oh, you know, that's us." <laughs> you know, and and uh, uh, he, you know, Russell said, "Well, why are you using? You know, the sale's not final. Why are you using my, you know, NPI number?" And and the guy at Philidor said, uh, "Well." Those are just details. The money is going to get wired soon. Everything's going to be just fine. And Russell said, uh, you know, no deal. Uh, this is, I don't even know what Philidor is. I don't know who I've negotiated with. You know, this is the last you'll hear of me. You're going to hear from my lawyer from now on. And he simply refused to negotiate further. He certainly, when Valiant sent him a bill for, you know, all of these millions of dollars of drugs that had shipped through his NPI number and, you know, millions of dollars that was in uh, R&O's bank account, he simply refused to send a check. He refused to make the wire transfer. And uh, All right, Rod, Roddy, let me, let me ask you this as we're finishing up this segment, because this to me appears to be out and out fraud. You know, it was $70 million was the size of that invoice that he knew nothing about that you uncovered. How, how, why wouldn't there be criminal liability for that? The whole, well, the whole Philidor, the whole Philidor is sham. Yeah, as it emerged, there was it last in in the uh, autumn, uh, late autumn of sixteen. There was a series of uh, uh, indictments by the Southern District of New York uh, of Andy Davenport, the guy who founded uh, Philidor, as well as Gary Tanner, a senior executive, a very senior executive at. Valiant, and there are, as, as Bethany noted, as you know, that investigation is not concluded. There are settlement talks between Valiant and federal prosecutors. Federal prosecutors have subpoenaed any number of other Valiant people and are pursuing, you know, those lines of inquiry. There's class action inquiries related to this. There's SEC. Uh, actions. Now, the government moved at a speed that makes a iceberg look like Usain Bolt. Uh, So we may all be dead or buried by the time they decide to act on it. But the last I've been able to to know, there are other people and, you know, other stuff they're looking at uh, related to Philidor. All right. Well, as you can see, great detective work there uncovering this whole scheme behind the scenes. And within six months, 80 billion of the 90 billion dollars of market value related to VRX um, Valiant stock disappears. Our final segment has anything changed? We're talking with Roddy Boyd, Bethany McLean, our final segment. They're investigative journalists. Of course, he's been talking about the Valiant drug scandal. And VRX, the stock symbol is going from $262. I just checked yesterday was $18.57, a 5 PE. Um, so some pretty big changes. Well, Bethany, what I want to ask you is um, tell us what's changed with, um, uh, with Valiant, where it is today, and has anything changed overall in the market after all of this? Well, so what changed with Valiant is a sudden wave of skepticism, starting with some of Roddy's excellent reporting, and you guys will come back to that or uh, talk about that around the sleazy things they were they were they were doing, and it really was all of a sudden this facade just cracked, and people began to realize just how incredibly sleazy this company was, and Congress began to investigate what was going on with price gouging and called Valiant, uh, among others, to come and testify about what they were doing to the price of drugs. But what's interesting is that here we are a couple of years later, and have things changed? Absolutely not. They really haven't. Congress didn't take any action um, on drug pricing, nor in reality will they probably ever. And big pharmaceutical companies continue to raise the prices on their drugs by double digits each year, which results in price increases over time that are of a huge magnitude. Um, and so they're, they're fundamentally, even though there was this huge uproar around Valiant and Congress investigated and there was Martin Shkreli and he was in the news and he ended up going to jail. Did anything change? I don't think so. So I know in the Netflix, Senator McCaskill says nothing illegal was found. How could that have been? And we'll have the details with Roddy, but 
how could there have been nothing been illegal found or something they could have taken action on? And where is Pearson now? Well, that's an interesting question. It's, it's a broader question to me because there's so much that goes wrong. These stories of business gone wrong, they seem so immoral that you think, well, there has, yeah. there, there has to have been a law broken somewhere along, yeah. along the way. And the most dispiriting thing is when there, there, there actually isn't. And in some of the things that, that Valiant did, um, um, there, there may yet be some, some wrongdoing. But around the core of the business model, which was coming up with ways to profiteer from from existing existing drugs and raising raising the price on, on these drugs, there's there's nothing illegal about that. It was it was perfectly it was perfect, if not morally acceptable behavior. It wasn't it wasn't illegal behavior, um, and I think that's that's it's 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 a challenge because drug companies used to just not do that. <laughs> they put the and, and in a world where every anybody will do anything in order to make a buck. What sort of curbs are there on 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 behavior like that? Um, Pearson got finally got kicked out um, as the CEO of, of Valiant, and I think he's still wrapped up in the legal mess um, surrounding the company. There still there are a number of investigations going on, and I don't think they're quite wrapped up um, at this point. And it remains to be seen what will what will happen to him. Now, um, Ackman, when he testified uh, before that uh, Senate committee, said that uh, the prices for Valiant would be now lowered across the board. Did that happen? That did not happen, at least not yet, for some of their most um, most most pro- most prominent drugs like cyprine and cupramine, these drugs that treat Wilson's disease that were small drugs but immensely profitable. The profit margin on those after Valiant raised the price to over three hundred thousand dollars a year for cyprine was around ni- over ninety percent. Um, they were huge contributors to the bottom line. Part of the the sad, tragic irony of this is that as Valiant collapsed, because Pearson had done so many acquisitions and had levered up the company with so much debt, in order for the company to survive, it needed every penny of profits it could produce. So it didn't have the finan- it no longer had the financial flexibility to lower the price of drugs and therefore reduce its profits. So this mousetrap Pearson built became a, a total trap for patients. Um, Valiant promised to lower the price on other drugs, nitroprest and isoprel, these drugs that are used for life-saving surgeries by cutting these deals with hospitals, but um, at least as the last time I had checked, a lot of the deals they had promised had not yet materialized. Um, so no, <laughs> that didn't come true either. The, the more things change, the more they stay the same. All right, um, Roddy, do you have any sense of, of what uh, reforms uh, w- would be needed, or what would you suggest uh, should be done on this big pharma uh, pricing or, or the way Wall Street uh, looks at this uh, at this business. Would you would you suggest any specific changes after we just heard nothing's really been done? Boy, I and mean, that's that's a great question, Jim. I think the changes that are probably going to have to happen are kind of twofold. One on drugs that are truly life saving, especially those with. Uh, communities of, of, of patients that are, you know, under 10, 20, 30,000 uh, uh, number, you're probably going to have to look at some level of governmental slash insurance company cooperation to keep price increases to something either that's manageable or to hold a certain price line. Because, I mean, as Bethany noted, I, even if you're a Rockefeller, uh, or, or Bill Gates, or, or even LeBron James. I mean, three hundred thousand dollars a year is a mighty, mighty large bill for something that eight years ago uh, was, you know, a hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars a month. Uh, so, so I think that's one thing. The second thing is, is probably a little bit in that vein, which would be allowing governmental like stuff like you know, Medicare, Health and Human Services, to negotiate prices that are, you know, more rational. I mean, I'm not saying price setting by the government. I'm saying kind of setting a, a, a bandwidth of prices that are acceptable. It's something that would, of course, allow a market to exist, uh, as well as uh, allowing a uh, profit uh, margin to be had by healthcare companies but something that wouldn't bankrupt or at least trigger these alarms in insurance companies saying, look, we won't pay for it above a certain price level. So 
So, I mean, I, I think that another thing probably would be allowing drugs to be imported from Canada in greater volume. I mean, that's something that is a bipartisan, it's being blocked in Senate, you know, on a, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, the healthcare companies spread enough uh, money around Capitol Hill, and all of a sudden there are these tremendous fake concerns about the health and safety of people, whereas, you know, Canadian pharmaceutical distribution and healthcare standards are, uh, you know, regularly exceed American. (laughs) So um, allowing a marketplace to exist, perhaps even speeding up the generic approval process, things of these natures that would at least, you know, at the margins have an effect. Boy, uh, it's a good point. I'm almost surprised that the government does not allow itself to negotiate for volume discounts on drugs. It would seem a logical uh, usage of the leverage the government has. It's been a great story. We've just heard you can go and watch that Netflix Dirty Money series on Valiant, where you'll see Bethany and Roddy uh, in it as well. And we want to thank Bethany McLean, Roddy Boyd. Bethany has an article on that Valiant investigation in Vanity Fair magazine. You can Google. And, Roddy, tell us what your website is. Sure. It's... Uh... S-I-R-S-Online.org, surf-online.org. And again, it is nonprofit. He does this just for the basically keeping Wall Street honest, so you're free to make donations there because it's very good work he's doing in behalf of all of us that are investors. This has been Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. You can find the YouTube version of the show. Search Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Go to Park City Productions 06604. See everybody again next Monday evening at 6 for another edition of Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell.